Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the high voltage seminar. Uh, this is the protecting power devices in electric vehicle applications session being presented by Will Harden. Uh, my name is Gang Yao Wang, and I will be the moderator for this session. All participants are muted for this session, so please use the chat function to ask a question and address it to everyone. We will be answering questions throughout uh, the webinar in chat. Also, chat if you are having any problems hearing or seeing the presentation. With that, uh, I will hand it to uh, Will to get started. Thank you very much, Gang Yao. Uh, so, you know, as Gang Yao said, I'm going to be talking about the protection of power devices, right? But uh, it, it's more of that, you know, what, what are you going to get out of this session? And uh, I, I, Initially, I'll go through a brief description of silicon carbide performance and and why why these benefits of silicon carbide you know we see the traction space moving in that direction and and what that means for the protection features that requirements uh, and then the big protection feature of course is is overcurrent sensing and so we'll go through uh, several different <clears throat> methods and and uh, different versions of of protecting against overcurrent cases, and then how to turn off the external uh, FET based on those those cases, right? And, and what are some of the trade-offs that you can make there? And then finally, I'll go through uh, other diagnostics. So in traction specifically, uh, the protecting the MOSFET and protecting the system isn't just about overcurrent. There, there are other things involved there. And with many traction inverter applications going to an ASOL rated uh, system, you know, we do have, TI has many features that are that are available in our drivers that, that assist in, in doing these ASOL designs, and so we'll go through some of those. Um, the part numbers that I'll talk about in this, uh, in this uh, presentation are the UCC 587X devices, which are our traction inverter focused safety compliant devices and then the UCC 2152X which is a still a full featured part but uh, has doesn't have some of the many of the uh, diagnostics that that the 5870 does but we do go through examples of how both of these devices solve problems so when when we look at the traction inverter market itself uh, we we find that it really fits into kind of this this square here with the 10 kilohertz and then as you go faster uh, we get up into the silicon carbide range and so the the power ratings of these applications are are really requiring both IGBT and silicon carbide or it can be filled by both IGBT and silicon carbide so we have to take both of these into account but as things move forward. Uh, we really see that silicon carbide has some some advantages over the IGBT. So the first being the the knee voltage, and uh, and it has a body diode, which uh, enables uh, you know third quadrant operation mode, and, and or it actually operates in third quadrant, but without the use of uh, an additional. A transistor. So, so all of the. I mean, I'm sorry. Uh, without the use of an additional diode, and so all of these things help to improve conduction losses versus IGBT. And then, in addition, there are, there are some advantages in switching losses as well, because the uh, the the eon and the off losses are are less. They also show less increase over temperature, as well as the reverse recovery. Uh, the reverse, reverse recovery losses are, are significantly less for silicon carbide. Um, and so, so these things really help silicon carbide improve switching losses versus IGBT. And the, the, the downside of all this is that silicon carbide are a bit more, uh, I don't know if fragile is the right word, but uh, a little bit more, more sensitive to the application conditions and so we have to do some 
different things with uh, with our protection in order to satisfy those. So we, if we look at a traction inverter from from a high level, uh, you know you see there there are many different places where where it could potentially fail and. This our, our gate driver needs to assist with as many of those as it can and, and prevent as many of those as it can. And so we have these different failure modes that, that we talk about and how the gate driver uh, could possibly help, right? And, and of course, you see a lot of uh, monitoring current through the FET and shut off powers and, uh, and protecting over current. Um, but there's also other other pieces of uh, watchdogs and checksums on configurations and and these other other things that, that we can do in the gate driver to really assist in in doing ASO rated systems and prevent prevent possible failure modes. And so first I'll go through overcurrent protection and and I think we should level set what specifically. Uh, we're, we're discussing here when we talk about short circuit, right? And, and this is overcurrent in effect, right? And so, so you see the, uh, the as the current goes, uh, the, the current goes in, and this is showing a IGBT specifically of hitting the the current hits some saturation level, and and our device should protect that and shut it off in time to prevent damage to the device. And we do this by, uh, or, 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 I'm sorry. So uh, showing the showing the overcurrent waveforms for uh, the two, two different devices for IGBT and silicon carbide, you can see that we have this uh, saturation kind of, uh, the saturation curve of IGBT is very flat and, and this helps to self-limit the current increase um, and uh, whereas the silicon carbide has a much larger linear region with a higher saturation current. And, and so in this case, the ID just continues to increase with an increase in VDS and, and then eventually breaks down. And so what this means is that for the same rated current and voltage, the IGBT reaches an active region for a significantly lower VCE as compared to silicon MOSFET, silicon carbide MOSFET. And when we look at the short circuit withstand time, so this is a short circuit case where we uh, where, where we have are monitoring the IDS and the, and the VGS, and, and we can define the minimal dissipated energy leading to device failure for these pulses by this equation here. Um, and the VDS typically is the uh, the DC link voltage and then the ID would be the device saturation current. The silicon MOSFET short circuit withstand time is significantly shorter than this. And, and so due, due to this, uh, you know, the thermal limitation, we have to make the response time significantly faster to support silicon carbide versus IGBT. So we do this with, with two different methods. Uh, the first method being DSAT, where we call it DSAT, where we detect the VDS of the MOSFET or the VCE of the IGBT, and we shut off the device uh, when that voltage, the VDS voltage, exceeds a threshold. Now, things that you have to take into account on this are blanking time so that you don't trigger in the middle of an edge because of the, the turn-on transients. And our default functions have a uh, programmable DSAT time with external components, right? So, so you have this current that's sourced out here into the into the blanking capacitor, and and that limits the rate at which the DSAT voltage can climb, and to where you can detect the 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 DSAT has exceeded the threshold. So, because the the, the DSAT voltage will vary based on different devices and, and the output characteristics. And so it is helpful to have a device where you can select multiple DSAT thresholds depending on where that where that voltage lies for, for that particular application. And devices like the UCC5870 have a SPRIVE programmability built into them that allows you to select those 
kind of DSAT functions, uh, the, the different DSAT thresholds, which makes it uh, kind of a platform type device, right, where you can use many different uh, uh, IGBTs or silicon carbide, depending on where your where your application lies, you know, the power requirements of your application. So when we look at silicon carbide, again, the DSAT is is often is is kind of exclusively used basically um, because of uh, something I'll talk about in a minute. But what we do with uh, silicon carbide is you're basically just sensing the IR drop uh, across the, the internal impedance and you select that IR drop based on, you select your DSAT voltage based on that IR drop across the, the, the impedance of the MOSFET. Excuse me, sorry about that. Um, and and uh, you set the, the DSAT threshold accordingly to whatever the current level that you're trying to prevent. So the second method is a, using an in, uh, overcurrent or short circuit protection um, based on either, uh, based on an integrated current sense. And so in this case, the module <clears throat> would have an output that was some percentage of the current flowing through the actual channel. And that gets put into a sense resistor, and then we measure the voltage across that sense resistor. The advantage of this is that it has, you can react to this very quickly and it's, and it's a bit more accurate than the DSAT. Um, the, the challenges, are that the, the module has to have the, the sense set in current mirror um, and there's a bit higher cost to it. And with silicon carbide, there aren't any available modules that have this integrated current sense to my knowledge. Uh, it is my understanding that it's in the roadmap, but that they do not exist at this point. And, and so this is why the DSAT, as I said earlier, was kind of exclusively used for silicon carbide. So another method that could be used, but is not used very often because of the uh, because of the, the challenges associated with it, is actually using a shunt resistor and measuring the the current through that shunt resistor, and it works very similarly to the overcurrent protection on the integrated current sense in that you measure the voltage across the sense resistor. So again, you have the same advantages as that case, but you also have this distinct advantage of having a high power loss uh, depending on what your your load current is so you have this huge uh, you have this large loss mechanism in the sense resistor and then in addition to that you have weak <clears throat> weak noise immunity because of the the gate loop noise caused by the parasitic inductance and for these reasons this uh, this methodology isn't used very frequently and but I, I wanted to include it for completeness. So when we look at the turnoff due to an overcurrent event, uh, one of the things we have to watch out for is this uh, avalanche limitation on the on the VCE or the, the the VDS. So when you shut off the the current very quickly you have all of these parasitics involved in your half bridge, right? You have uh, trace inductance, you have package inductance in the module, uh, you have just uh, loop, in, uh, loop inductance in, in the, the other components in the device. And all of these, when you turn off the current very quickly, you get a, a very large overshoot on, on VDS, which can damage, cause the, cause the device to avalanche. And so we have to take precautions to prevent this from happening. And we do this with, there, there's two methods to do this. One is called soft turnoff, and the second is called two-level turnoff. And for, for these two, these two uh, methods are similar, but they, in that they both uh, turn off the gate slower than just ripping it low. 
Um, but you can see that the when the when we do the two level turnoff, we we pull down the gate until we get to a Miller plateau, and then we hold it at that Miller plateau for some fixed amount of time uh, to allow the to allow the, the the gate to discharge. And then once once that time elapses, we pull it down the rest of the way to to turn it turn the device off. So this. Uh, th this uh, uh, reduces the the di, and so the the voltage doesn't spike nearly as much. The second method is the soft turnoff, which is one of the most aptly named features because that's what it does. It soft turns off, so you you reduce the drive strength significantly and just hold that drive strength at some reduced current in order to drop the uh, drop the voltage on on the gate slowly and reduce the DC overshoot the trade-offs between these two um, are in my in my view it's it's kind of what what you've been or what, what you're you're used to doing um, I we have seen both of these implemented throughout the industry um, the the two level turnoff is is a bit more complicated or complex to to implement because you do have to know or you do have to program these timings and and the uh, the the thresholds for the the plateau region and things like this. Uh, so again, having having these things and being able to support multiple modules means that you should have some programmability built into the device. And that 5870 provides that we can program the timing and the turnoff and the the plateau voltage. All of these things are independently programmable to support many different applications. And I'll show you that in the coming slides. I'll show you some results from from different settings uh, in in the, in the next next few slides. So one of the one of the big important uh, important things for for these turn -off, these turn off features is how how quickly we can turn them off, and uh, there there's several items there are several several timings that go into a turn off right? and uh, the turn off time and, and one of them is the leading edge blanking time the the blanking time which is the the so there's a leading edge blanking time where we do a transition and we wait for the leading edge blanking time before we turn on this this uh, uh, current source to source current, and then there's a blanking time which is programmed by this capacitor and resistor. Or, I'm sorry, this capacitor, excuse me, and then there's the TDS off, which is uh, how fast any propagation delays internal to the device, how long it takes to uh, to get through those, um, how, how long it takes to for the comparator to trip, and these kind of things, and so all of these go into account when you talk about detection time. With the the ST, uh, so when we when we look at these uh, when we look at these times, um, the you know, I think there's yeah uh, when we talk about uh, the the silicon carbide versus IGBT, um, you know, IGBT can survive for tens of, of microseconds, but with silicon carbide, that total time is reduced to uh, on the order of one to two microseconds, and so there you do have to have some uh, significant improvements in the gate drive response uh, or the the VSAT response in the gate driver. To support the silicon carbide. So again, uh, one thing I should note is when you know, as I discussed, the, the the blanking time for this is determined by this charge current charging up this cap, and that's given by this uh, threshold here. And and so you can see the way the way this would work is as the VDS uh, rises. It eventually turns this uh, uh, diode off, and that allows the cap to to charge up. And once that cap charges up to the uh, the, the threshold, 
that's when the the comparator would trip, the internal comparator would trip, and the, and the, the external transistor would be turned off. So I do have here a couple of uh, a couple of slides on the actual response that you could expect from from our devices for both overcurrent and, and DSAT. Uh, these tests were done using a, a double pulse test setup. So I thought I'd spend a couple of minutes to to go through what a double pulse set setup is, since this is a, kind of an introduction seminar. So when we do these. Uh, double pulse test. The idea is that you pulse these uh, these transistors twice and build up current through the inductor, which allows you to look at high current and high voltage applications without actually having to build a 200 kilowatt inductor, right? Because you're only looking at two pulses. So, so you build current up, you turn the sky on, you build current up through the inductor. And you turn the sky off, and it recirculates through the through the high side transistor or diode, and then you would turn it on again to build up the current even higher, and watch or, or monitor how the device performs uh, in those cases. And so here's here's looking at how we would define the response time. So. Uh, you're you're stepping the the VSC pin and looking at when the actual output drops, and so you can see for this particular device we respond within 255 nanoseconds, and this takes into account any D glitches, any propagation delays that are in inside the device. So so we really do de design our devices to cover silicon carbide and IGBT. So here we, we show the response to DSAT. And this particular device is set up to perform the to a level turnoff when it receives the, the DSAT uh, fault. And I have here, you know, again, I, I talked about the 5870 being a adjustable device. And so this is just showing what happens when you have these different, uh, different thresholds of of Miller Plateau, or, or in this particular case, it's, uh, it's specifically Miller Plateau. So we have a nine volt case here and a 10 volt case here. And, and so we see the, the DSAT voltage rising uh, until it hits the threshold. And then at that point, we pull the gate low until we hit the, the plateau region that's defined. And we sit and hold that that uh, output at, at that plateau time for the fixed amount of time. And then after that, we pull the output the rest of the way down to the, to the, uh, to, to off, right? So you can see here the, the difference between these two, the, the nine volt versus the 10 volt plateau is, you can, you can see the difference in shutdown energy and the difference in VC overshoot. So I talked a little bit about the shutdown energy earlier, having is, uh, and the, these two things are kind of independent or are indirectly proportional uh, to each other. And so the more shutdown energy you have, there, I'm sorry, the more shutdown energy you have, the lower your VC overshoot is, right? And you can see these two things. So it's, it's a trade off between the shutdown energy and the VC overshoot. And when you have all these programmable, uh, these programmable features, you can make that trade off in your application. So here's showing something similar with, a, again, a DSAT response with safe shutdown, but this time showing the soft turnoff feature as opposed to the two level turnoff feature. So again, we see DSAT rise up, you know, it's directly proportional to the ICE, right? We're going up to 4,000 amps here. Again, a double pulse test allows you to do these kind of things rather than having, having to build in a, an entire inverter that would support that. And once, once we hit that, uh, that threshold, 
the DSAT threshold, the, the VGE you can see is turned off slowly. And that attempts to limit the VCE overshoot, right? And so we have here, we have a, a soft turnoff of 600 milliamps. So we actually have a current source integrated that, that just pulls the gate low with 600 milliamps in a very controlled manner versus a 300 milliamp case. And again, these are optimizing the trade-off between shutdown energy and VC overshoot. So you can see for the 0.6 amp, we have a shutdown energy of about a joule and a VC overshoot of 248 volts. Whereas for the 300 milliamp case, now the, now the, the shutdown energy doubles almost to, to two joules, but the VC overshoot is significantly decreased by 100 volts. And so this is really the trade-off of where, where you need to be for your application, right? What, what, what soft turnoff current do you choose uh, in order to in order to uh, 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 optimize the, the situation for your application. So uh, for, for, so this is, so the previous two devices that I showed, the previous two results that I showed you were for the UCC 5870. Um, this is something similar uh, but this one's showing with a, an 800 volt uh, DC link voltage um, and showing you the response for the UCC21750. So this has, again, the soft turnoff. Um, and we can see here that for this particular device, DSAT goes up and, and when it turns off, this one takes nearly two microseconds to turn off and the shutdown energy for this one is around 100 millijoules and the overshoot is limited to 120 volts. So, so again, we have many different devices that depending on what your application requirements are, we, we have these protection features built in that we can mix and match and, and really support very many applications. So this is, uh, uh, this is a similar, uh, similar device that's showing a uh, soft turn off with a different uh, different detection or a different timing. So this one is a, a 600 nanosecond time, so it's uh, pulled down a bit faster. And again, the shutdown energy goes up to 0.24 joules, but the VDS overshoot goes down to, to 80 volts. So there are cases where you might want to use uh, DSAT, but the threshold for your particular application isn't available in the device. We have come up with a method to use the actual OC and SC comparators in using uh, some external resistors, uh, external resistor divider in order to implement a DSAT-like function that enables you to really select whatever DSAT threshold you need. Because in general, our, the OC and SC thresholds are, are a lower value. So when you look at a DSAT threshold, it's on the order of five, six, seven, 10, you know, 14 volts. Whereas the SC and OC values for the integrated current sense are generally sub two volts, right? So a couple hundred millivolts, to, to two volts in that in that range. And so using resistor dividers, you can get a more, uh, a, a wider range of, of DSAT thresholds if needed. And this circuit here shows you how to do that as well as uh, how to calculate blanking times and, and SEO, uh, SEO times based on that circuit. So this is showing some results uh, with, with that particular circuit and also comparing the different, uh, the, the, different the, the difference between hard turnoff and soft turnoff to give you kind of an apples to apples comparison. So 
you can see the the uh, the, the voltage uh, voltage things here the voltage uh, uh, gradient here is is about 100 volts per division and, and this is about an amp per division and so so we're ramping the current here up to almost one and a half amps a little bit below there it's almost up to one and a half amps and then shutting it off suddenly and you can see this VDS just just spikes insanely high right this is uh, one two three almost 350 400 volt uh, spike and then using a soft turn off for a hard short that that significantly can reduce this this overshoot right like we've been talking about but you can just see the most glaring difference between turning it off hard and turning it off soft uh, going from you know 450 volts of overshoot to 50 maybe And so this is really trying to get the point across of, of, of why it's important for for this soft turnoff feature. <clears throat> so when we uh, when, when we talk about that uh, that overcurrent circuit when it uh, one of the things that needs to be so this is some performance in that over 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 uh, that overcurrent circuit again but one of the things that needs to be taken into account is that there is some switching noise from the uh, from the, the, the actual switching because if we go back to this you can see we use the out H to uh, discharge the the cap and and then there's some uh, there's some capacitance and parasitics associated with this, and so when when that's turned on and off, you do get noise on it, and care must be taken to size those thresholds for to make sure that this normal switching during the transition, this normal noise from the transition, doesn't rise to the level where you you will trip the OC. So these are uh, another thing that you need to look at. Uh, when you're designing this particular circuit. <clears throat> so um, uh, now that I've finished that here, um, I see that there's a bunch of questions. I will try to address some of them unless, Kang Yao, have you been, uh, doesn't look like it, okay. So there, there was a question of uh, the depend uh, the device limitation, the detection and action time for a 16 kilohertz frequency motor driver. So yeah, the, this one uh, it really yeah, it really uh, does. Yeah. Oh, go we ahead. Are, I think I have I did have some answers uh, in the chat. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay, you've been answering in the chat. Okay, I, I just didn't see your answers. All right. Thank you, Gunga. Appreciate that. Yeah. No problem. Okay. So, uh, so moving on to the additional protection features. So these these uh, features here, these will be specific to um, Gunga. Can you mute, can you mute your phone, please? You're uh, <laughs> you're you're clicking. <laughs> no problem. Uh, so, so many of these features are, I, I'll be using the UCC 5870 as a reference um, for these features, but uh, we do have like OV and UV integrated into many of our devices, um, but uh, just to kind of explain how they are and, or what they are and, and why they're needed, uh, I'm just going to use the UCC 5870 as an example. So for this one specifically for over voltage and under voltage, uh, we do support OV and UV on all of the supplies, right? So we have a primary supply because this is an isolated gate driver. We have a primary supply. We have a bipolar secondary supply, which means we can use a positive voltage and a negative voltage. And so the, 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 the safety concerns the failure mechanisms would be if any one of these supplies failed, 
we would need to know about that because it directly impacts the performance of the external transistor, right? If you're not getting as much voltage as you, as you need on the gate, then your RDS on is going to be higher and you're going to have, uh, you're going to have issues with, with the, the, the loading, you know, as, as you're, you're loading, right? Um, and so you need to know when it's under voltage and, and over voltage prevents, presents a, an SOA problem, right? If you over voltage the gate on your transistor, it's going to damage it and that, that can have catastrophic effects. So, you, you know, we really need to know when these supplies are out of range, right? And one of the ways we can do this is having an OV and a UV, an over voltage protection and UV under voltage protection built into the device. And so this particular device has many different thresholds. And why, why do you need many different thresholds? Well, there are many different types of switches. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and when we specifically talk about IGBT and silicon carbide, well, these are used with different gate drive voltages, right? Uh, you know, IGBT, kind of a standard one, is, is around 15 volts, whereas with silicon carbide, that can go up to 20. And, and so, so you need these different thresholds in order to customize the, the gate driver for your application, right? So another uh, interesting feature that, that we have in our devices is this thing we call VCE clamp. And so, so we've talked a lot about the VC overshoot and, and how damaging that can be for those external transistors, right? And so one of the one of the ways that this is solved is by putting a Zener clamp across the gate for the for the external power transistor. The problem the problem that this can lead to is that now you have a Zener clamp, but but this poor clamp is trying to pull up on this uh, on this gate drive output, right? And and that drive output can be very very strong, uh, especially for like the UCC five eight seventy for example. It has a hundred million pull down, and so so that gate drive is just very very strong. And so, uh, so what we can so what we can do is we implement this VCE clamp feature that allows us to sense when the zener is breaking down, and then we will go into that soft turnoff condition that will allow this clamp. So we we kind of get we take the driver. Out of the out of the circuit at that point, and and allow the clamp to do its job and, and clamp the VDX voltage to to the the threshold that it needs to be to protect that device. And this, by nature, this the circuit has to be extremely fast, and so we have an intervention time on this guy of around 20 nanoseconds. So so it will sense that the over voltage has occurred or that the breakdown has occurred, it'll sense that it'll put us in the soft shutdown and then it holds that soft shutdown for some fixed amount of time. And that fixed amount of time is 100 or 200 or 300 nanoseconds, depending on how you program that. And, and so you would, from an application point of view, you would have to look at, okay, what are, what are my application, where, where are my application points at where uh, it's, it's causing this overshoot and how long do I need to, how long is this plant typically active for? And that would be the methodology for, for using that, that hold time and setting that hold time. So one of the other big, big features that, that's required for, for safety standards is gate voltage monitoring. And this is, it answers the simple question of is what I'm what I'm outputting from my gate driver is that what I expect it to be? So, as I always I always like to joke, does the goes into equal the goes out to? Uh, and so we do this in in a a two prong approach. So because it is isolated, we have a isolation or we have a detection method. That will that will test from the pin, the input pin, and it looks at that and it compares it to the signal that's sent across the isolation barrier. And and we have a 
method, a methodology in place that says, okay, have I received across the isolation barrier the same polarity as what's at the pin? So we have this, the, that, that part's covered. And then we have a second detection where we look at does the, does the, the, the signal that I received, does that equal what the actual gate is, what the actual gate threshold is? And so if you look at our device, we have, you know, a Kelvin sense to the actual gate of the, of the module. And so while the out H is pulling high, you know, we're sensing is that, is that gate actually high versus when out L is pulling low, we're sensing, okay, well, is that gate actually low, right? And if it's not, we can go into either a high impedance mode. So, you know, this, this tries to help in the case where uh, the, you know, your, your gate is shorted, for instance, and try not to blow the gate driver up by turning it on while it's shorted. Uh, this, this would be, uh, this would help in preventing that. There are some times that the short's hard enough that you just can't do anything about it, but we're trying to give it the old college try and, and do as best that we can. But, uh, but again, these fault responses are all programmable in the device. So, you know, if you just want to turn it off, that's fine. Or, or if you want to do nothing and, and allow the, the MCU to control everything that's a, a, a function that's available as well. So one of, one of the other uh, pieces to this is, is how do we prevent the short circuit before it starts, right? So, so one, of the, one of the ways that the short circuit can happen is shoot through, which means that the high side and the low side are on at the same time, which is not a good situation. And so to, to combat this, you would use this kind of cross-coupled detection scheme where we have this in minus pin and then in plus pin. And the in plus pin is the one that defines the gate drive output. Whereas the in minus pin detects the opposite, the, uh, the opposite side, the, op the either the high side detects the low side or vice versa, uh, detects when that pin is high and low. And the, the point is, is that in plus and in minus should never be high at the same time. Because if they are, that's a case where shoot through could happen, and that's not good. And so we have these detection methods in there to prevent that from happening. In addition to that, uh, many motor controllers require some uh, some amount of dead time, right? This is how you prevent shoot through, and and we have methods and and features in the device that will ensure that that programmable dead time, or I'm sorry, that will ensure that that dead time is implemented, right? And so we actually, uh, we actually will implement that dead time ourselves in order to prevent uh, shoot through from happening. And that, again, in order to satisfy many different applications, that, that time is programmable. Um, and there's quite a large range on it. So we can support many different applications. <clears throat> so one of the one of the things um, I, I wasn't uh, I was kind of going back and forth about is is you know what I consider active Miller clamp uh, safety feature and and I think you know that, that you would say that it was because it does prevent shoot through uh, somewhat right and so so I put it in here because I, I I figure it's a it's a safety feature. And, you know, for those of you that don't know what an active Miller clamp is, um, so there's a, I think I have it on the, yeah, this is probably a better slide to start with first, but uh, there's a, there's these parasitic capacitances in these, in, in the external transistors. And, and as this switch node is rapidly changing, right? So it's flying up, flying down, um, you have these capacitive couple coupling to the gate of the transistor, and you can see that if this switch node was to fly up at some rate that allowed 
it to couple to the gate and turn on this low side, well, now you have a shoot through problem, right? And so what, what the active Miller clamp does is it gives you a, so this is the normal gate drive pull down. And the active Miller clamp is actually an additional, uh, additional um, FET or additional path that goes directly, it's kind of Kelvin to the gate itself and goes directly into a stronger pull down. So rather than have this 10 ohms in there, um, this, this gate is actually pulled to ground with maybe half an ohm, right? And so you can see that in this waveform, where this is just an, a standard switching waveform, and uh, I have it circled where you can see where the gate comes down and there's a bit of a Miller plateau. And then, and then at the very end here, you know, these last two or three volts, you can see that it's sharply pulled down, right? So, because this is the part where it's switching over from you know, that 10 ohm drive to the half ohm drive, right? And so you can see that, that, uh, that, that uh, fast pull down there, right? And so, oh, look at this. Forgot I had that in there. So, so this is what I was talking about with the with the external with the extra path to to pull down that gate to to VE to to turn it off. Right. So going back to the previous slide. So you can support this in one of two ways. Uh, there is a we have an internal Miller clamp, or you can also run it an external Miller clamp. So I talked about you know the 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 half ohm pull down impedance. If, if for some reason the, your application required something stronger than that, or if you're running multiple modules in parallel and you wanted to have a, a you know, a, a, a pull down FET for each individual module, you could do that. Um, but uh, the, but so we can support both. And then, you know, again, the, the Miller clamp threshold is adjustable. So we can support you know, any kind of, uh, or multiple different applications. Um, yeah, so I guess the other benefit to having this external Miller clamp is that uh, you can lower the inductance from the gate to the, or from the clamp to the gate terminal if your, uh, if your, your module is, is fairly far away from the, from the gate driver itself. So uh, one last, uh, or, or I guess an additional uh, function that we have, and this is this particular function is specific to the 5870, is we have an ADC that's built into the device. And with this ADC, uh, you can measure, it's, it's a fairly precise ADC, it will accept uh, external voltage as well as having an internal uh, an internal reference if if you're if you find the, the performance of it acceptable um, but if you want uh, you know higher precision than one percent or one and a half percent you can put a precision reference on the output to to get a more precise measurement uh, the the benefits to this or the, the the use cases I should say for this ADC for protection are the, the the biggest one is the the temperature sensing, and so to get an idea of what your module temperature is, you can use the ADC to read the 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 voltage back from that uh, from from that that temperature sensor, and and we have all of the biases integrated to bias the temperature sensor and 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 read that back. So this will allow you to always know what the junction temperature is of your of your external power switch, uh, and then in addition to this, we have a thermal sensor on the actual device gate driver itself, and so you would be able to read that read that junction temperature back as well for just a total system thermal management. But the the voltage. The, the ADC is really agnostic to what it's measuring as long as the voltage is, is within its full scale range. Uh, it can be a temperature diode or, or, or 
anything, right? And so, so some of the ideas that we have seen in the industry using this for is, is for a redundant high voltage measurement for the for the DC link. Uh, so, you know, it, it, ensuring that you don't have an over voltage or a, an under voltage on the on the bus, it, this gives you an ADC on the high voltage side, right? So that that can be very convenient for uh, for for reading voltages like this. Another one is measuring VCE. So, talking about um, we we have a, a, a specific uh, methodology that we use for the ADC that I'll talk about in a second that makes it that uh, makes it uh, advantageous to do this VCE measurement. But this is this would be a way to detect or diagnose if your external transistor was. Uh, was becoming damaged or, or open or, or shut, right? So, so you can take a measurement of the VCE voltage and compare that to what you think it should be in the motor controller and make a decision on the health of that external transistor. And the way, the, one of the reasons this works is because we have a, a, center, a center sampling mode, which the way the way the center sampling mode is is we predict what the center of the PWM on cycle or off cycle is based on the previous cycle. And because in traction, the, 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 the duty cycle doesn't change a tremendous amount from one cycle to the next, uh, we're able to do this fairly accurately. And in the, in the device itself, it is, has the, the ability to program what channel you want to read and, and if you want to read it during the on time or the off time. And so you could see that doing a VCE measurement and planning it in the exact middle of the, the PWM cycle, uh, it's set up well in order to do that. The limitation for center, center channel or center sampling mode is that uh, you would have, um, you only get one cycle or one, one measurement per PWM cycle, right? Or per PWM on and then one in PWM off. And so that limits the amount of information that you can get back. So to combat this, we have an edge sampling mode, which looks at the, looks for an edge on the PWM and then just starts taking samples. And that, uh, as, it, as it's taking those samples, it'll just go until it gets to the next PWM edge. So we still avoid the noise of the PWM transition, but it's not in the kind of ideal uh, point, which would be the center, right? So, so this is a trade-off of sampling frequency versus noise. And then we have a, a, the hybrid mode, which you know, as you, as you can see, the, the center sampling mode requires you to have PWM edges in order to get data for, for the ADC. And so we have this hybrid mode where it will switch in, or it will operate in center sampling mode until it, until that, the, the on time or the off time is held for some time, and that time is around uh, 10 milliseconds, I believe. So if it doesn't make a transition within that time, then it automatically switches over to edge mode so that you can still get proper data and updated data, even though you have no PWM cycle. So maybe you can diagnose why you have no PWM cycle if you if it's unknown at that point, right? So another, uh, another way that we use this IGB, or I'm sorry, this ADC is for power switch VGTH monitoring. And so there's been a couple of studies out, and, and I have a link here to one specifically for IGBT, but they have also done some preliminary studies on silicon carbide, where you can, by, by measuring the change in threshold voltage, you can, you can determine or detect an early warning failure of your external power switches. And the way that we do this is we use the, the so there's a, it's a commanded uh, diagnosis, right? So you would say, okay, go and do this VGTH measurement. And you send the spot command and we set it up so we effectively diagnose the external transistor 
and we measure the threshold voltage that is at. So we put some current out through DSAT and into the, the transistor and and uh, and pull up uh, out H to that, that DSAT node. And then we measure what the threshold voltage is and we report that back. And then the idea is that the motor controller would keep track of that threshold voltage and, and once it changed some percentage, it would say, okay, well, there, there's something going wrong here. You need to visit a, a shop, right? And, and, uh, and, and get that taken care of. But it gives you an early warning life indicator rather than leaving someone stranded on the side of the road is, is the idea. And you can see here, this is what it looks like from a, uh, uh, from a circuit point of view. So the V gate comes up and then the temperature, the measurement is taken somewhere in this, uh, this neighborhood over here about around uh, two, my, uh, two milliseconds after the, the function starts. So this would be done as part of a key on cycle for, uh, for the device, uh, for, the, for the, the inverter. And then uh, finally, with with all of the, when we look at a, an ASOL rated system, uh, in order to in order to implement these kind of things, um, we do have some built in self checks for for our devices. So when you look at an ASOL uh, system, there there's a latent fault detection and a primary fault detection, and and you know you need to stay above or above some percentage um uh, of detection uh for for these faults and and so so the way we do this is we have some some built-in self checks that allow you to detect latent faults like in the so these are the checkers of the checkers right so so as part of a key on cycle you would go through and and when it when it powers up we automatically run some of these faults right like the the latent checks on on the clocks and the ov and uv comparators uh, and then the uh, internal regulator comparators. So we automatically run those every every power up. But then there's also the there's also diagnostics on the external circuits themselves, right? Uh, like the DSAC comparator, or the OCP, the overcurrent comparators, or the VC clamping, or the gate monitoring. Um, and then the, we also have some features where you can you can use to detect open and shorted external components, right? So so, for instance, this uh, VGTH monitor uh, is a is a really good uh, method to diagnose a problem with the external DSAT, uh, you know, open components on the external DSAT, right? Um, or we have a pull-up currents to to test the overcurrent and, and short circuit current uh, external resistors, right? <clears throat> And you know specifically with the with the the BIST for gate monitoring, this this would this that we actually would look at both on and off, right? There there are two separate BIST built in that allow you to check the gate monitoring function in both in both positions. And so this can also be used to detect open uh, open open circuits on the on the, the gate clamp. I'm sorry. Open circuits on the on the gate resistor. And then finally, you know, as part of as part of this uh, this programmability, there is there there is some uh, some some errors that are I'm sorry some some possible error sources that are introduced as part of this. But but we've also done a uh, done some work to diagnose and, and protect against those as well, right? So, so for instance, for for all of our uh, for all of our, our programming uh, registers, there is a CRC protection on that. So, once once the configuration registers are locked down, we are constantly checking those registers to make sure that no bits have flipped, and we use a, a CRC protection for those. For all of our internal memory for you know trim and these kind of things, uh, the we have CRC protection. There's a CRC protection on spy transfers to ensure that the spy communication is valid. 
Uh, and then additionally, we have the in fault one and in fault two pins that can be configured to report uh, report various uh, faults and warnings back to back to the host, uh, so that uh, they can diagnose any kind of any kind of open open issues. So with that, um, we can move on to to any other open questions or. Uh, or uh, I, I don't know, Ganya, if there's any open questions that, that, uh, that we need yes. to address. Uh, okay. So one question is is about uh, the time. So the question is, is the uh, uh, UCC 870 designed to be operated with zero data time? Or is this like in plus in minus supervision intended as an additional safety layer and the data time as the input is expected? Uh, so, so, so we can we 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 can operate with zero dead time. Uh, that 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 dead time uh, programming uh, it can be programmed to zero. In which case, we would just look at n plus and n minus, and as long as they don't overlap, then we we operate just fine. Um, but if you program a dead time into into that register, then we will ensure that that dead time exists. Uh, otherwise, we will throw a fault. Now, what we do based on that fault is dependent on how you program it, right? So, so you can program it to make no action and just and just uh, just report the fault, or you can you can program it to turn turn the device off. It's uh, it's configurable in that in that manner. Cool. Uh, yeah, I think that's the only open question. Uh, Okay. Uh, I think it's yeah. Uh, thanks, Will, for the presentation, and uh, thank everyone for joining us. Uh, all session recordings and presentations will be available to view later this week on tr.com/high-voltage-seminar. Uh, you will also receive an email with links to the on-demand presentation and a post-event survey. We would like you uh, would like your feedback so we can continue to improve our content for future seminars. Uh, thank you again and have a great, great rest of your day, everyone.